It's a cordless ratchet, as favoured by mechanics the world over, but this one is a super cheap one from eBay. And I got it really just to take apart, and I get the feeling from the fact that it's got these label positions but nothing in them, that it is just a generic unit. So the idea of these is that you can put on a suitable socket, here's a lovely purple one, and it acts like a standard ratchet, including the little uh, toggle at the back that you can use to reverse direction, and you can just use it to actually ratchet like this, but not on super stuck bolts. Uh, however, what makes this a bit special is that when you pull the trigger and it is just a single speed, it's going to make, make a bit of noise. It will rotate that, and then, and this bit got me initially, when you turn this round, it rotates in the opposite direction. Because uh, I initially thought that these things had a gearbox and then some really strong cogwheel for converting to right angle drive. It turns out it's a lot simpler than that. In reality, oh look, it grease everywhere. That's fine. In reality, if you watch this ratchet mechanism now, if I actually click that round, you can actually see, can you really see it moving? Not really. There's not a lot of visible movement. But this is the ratchet mechanism, and uh, the motor actually just makes that jiggle backwards and forwards, and in doing so, it clocks it round step by step. It's a very odd system. I thought initially there might be impact, just because of the noise. It makes this loud rat rattling noise, simply because it is shuggling that backwards and forwards. Very clever. There's also a little white LED here, so you can see what you're shuggling, uh, and also a battery level indicator here, which shows you the state of charge left. It'll be very simple. Let's pop the battery out of it. The battery is a 12 volt battery. It most likely contains 18650s. Uh, I'll see how long this video is. If the video goes on super long, I'll just put the battery and its charge in a separate video. But the main thing in this video is this one. It has another little thing. It's got an on-off on function that just locks the trigger and that's it. So let's start taking it to bits. That's what we're here for. I'll just start randomly taking screws out and see at what point it just disintegrates. I suppose I should make a note of which screws go where just in case they're different lengths, but hopefully they'll all be a similar size. Let's check that out. Similar size, similar size. Probably the wrong screwdriver for this, but it's the one that came to hand. Similar size, and finally... Get out. Similar size. They're all the same size of screw. I've also noticed there's a little, couple of little metal tangs here. Probably just the strength to stop the spling apart and the batteries put in. So to get them out, I'm going to have to leave them up. Maybe, yes, they just pop up like that. That's useful to know. And that just leaves these screws here. I believe these were decent repetition. I guess, ultimately, because China has lots of garages and they're not necessarily total status wars like like in other countries where they want the latest Snap-on or uh, Milwaukee and stuff like that. They're probably quite happy to use these, but I get the feeling that for super heavy duty, um, you want probably to get a decent brand. One with a warranty, which makes me think of Kami at uh, Tecamo HD. It's a YouTube channel where Cami is a mechanic, uh, and Brandon and Sean and others, who go and fix heavy diesel stuff in Canada. And it's interesting listening to Cami talking about his tools, because the way he says, yeah, I've warranted this one five times, and it's like, oh, and it's prominent brand, because he really hammers them. Ultimately, I suppose the manufacturers rely on the fact that not many mechanics are going to really abuse the tools to death, and... I don't think Cam is abusing them in the sense of just damaging them. I think it's just his work is very, very heavy. There's not much in it. There's a big motor. There's a little circuit board down there that they've heat staked in so it can't come out. That's the LED's not really bothered about that. A couple of wires going up to the LED. Where's the resistor? Oh, it's coming off that little circuit board. So the resistor for the LED up there is probably off this circuit board as well. And the little switch. Not really much to see here, and the battery clips. Let's pop that out. Okay. Am I going to be able to get much further in here? I can see a pin that looks as though it's designed to 
lock things in. I'm entering Ave territory here. Let's let's use the incorrect tool to get this out. A blunt pair of side cutters. <gasps> that worked. Is that a good thing to do? <laughs> yeah, apparently it is. Oh, there's a planter gearbox. <laughs> That's going to go together again, I think. What have we got in there? We've got uh, the bits the planter gearbox was supposed to be going into. <laughs> right. I may have done the wrong thing. <laughs> Not to worry. Uh, what about in here? I want in here to see how I can get this off. Or is it just... Oh, maybe it comes out from inside. Ooh. Right, so I'm just going to grab that with a pair of pliers. And a hoi kit. Well, another bit's come out. Uh, quite oily, as you would expect. And then there's a triangular drive. Let's hoik the triangular drive. Oh, there it is. That's all we're looking for. Uh, that's the little reciprocating pin. That is the very thing here that will snap off when you try using this with so much force to loosen a stuck bolt that it suddenly uh, suddenly goes loose and uh, it doesn't work anymore. That's the bit. So what about this? Oh, and then you can swivel this round. I don't think you're supposed to swivel it round. Oh, and there's a little rocker in there uh, just to actually uh, allow for that movement. Can you see that? Uh, I'm regretting not having paper towels now. Uh, one moment, please. And I'm back. I took a, an opportunity to go and see if I could find my circuit pliers. No, I couldn't. Uh, so I tried using an inappropriate tool. I could not get that circle out. It's one of those Jesus clips that you shout Jesus when it pings across the room. And it would never be found again. So it's maybe a good thing. It's probably also full of springs. But there is a little pivoty thing that I was talking about. Now you can see it. That that pin goes into. And as it rotates, it basically it rotates and it pushes this ratchet backwards and forwards. Mm hmm. Jolly good. So uh, that didn't take too long. Uh, so let's take a look at the battery then. So, summary fairly powerful motor, single stage planetary gearbox, driving onto uh, this rotating pin that then jiggles the ratchet. Oh, that's popping out. Uh, backwards and forwards to clock it round. Very simple, very straightforward. It's much simpler than I was expecting. Right, tell you what, I'm going to. Do Clean all this up, and then we'll explore the battery. One moment, please. Okay, next part of the teardown, the battery pack. Incidentally, I got this all back together. It worked. Fine. But then I suddenly thought, what if I could actually change that pin? What if the pin that is likely to shear in there is swappable? So I took it all apart again. Uh, it is not swappable. That's a shame. Maybe the whole insert is. I'm not really sure. Anyway, let's take a look at the battery, which is most likely... Three eighteen six fifties. It has a little charge port on the side, and the charger you get is a little plug-in charger that plugs straight into the battery. I suppose that makes sense. This thing looks as though it's clipped together. Let's use force, the force, and try not to burst any lithium batteries. Is that going to make it open? Well, that's a clip. I'm going to shine a light down here. And see, is there any other clip? Okay, right. I think I may have to unclip something down there. Well, I'll just prize randomly. What's the worst could happen? Oh, no, that could break that if I do that. Uh, let's just... Right, so I may have to pause. This is not coming out. Maybe there's a clip down there. Hold on, I'll just shove the screwdriver up here. What's the worst could happen? I could burst the battery pack. It would still work. That's changing shape, the battery pack. I'm not sure the battery pack is supposed to change shape. Right, one moment, please. See, I gave up too soon the sides. The other clips are under here. So there's two clips under here that you just have to get down and carefully prise them out. It's in this springy plastic that actually clicks it in. Uh, and then the other clip is at the back. There are our three 18650s. Uh, not much circuitry. Not much circuitry at all. And it looks like it's uh, uh, got all the circuitry on one side, right? Tell you what, tell you what. I'll take a picture of this and we can explore it. Not that there's much to explore, but I shall do that. One moment, please. And resume. Okay, it's a very straightforward thing. 
It's got a chip dedicated to protecting three cells. The chip's number is CSC5113A. Not much information about that online, but it turns out... I had this little module from eBay, and it is almost identical. It's a slight component variation, but it is more or less the same circuitry. And the chip number on this one was... Uh, CM1033 and there is a data sheet for that so we can take a look at the circuitry so things worth looking at here the batteries are connected with uh, the tabs coming here plus there's also a connection there and a connection going to the bottom of the uh, battery stack here so it basically has the connections all the way along the battery so it can monitor the voltage. There's a bit of filtering circuitry here, 1K resistors and capacitors, so it can basically look at the voltage across the cells and see if any one of them has gone over voltage uh, or reached 4.2 volts or been over discharge below about 3 volts. And if it does, it will turn off one of these MOSFETs. This little A2SHB small MOSFET and series of the diode is from the auxiliary charge contact here because you can charge this by plugging it into a, a, a charging base but it also has this charging socket built in with the positive pin connected straight to the positive which is the other connection for the charge port and the negative here is connected over to this metal plate and that goes uh, via this diode that's why the diode is pointing with the band towards the negative um, and this transistor here this little MOSFET it doesn't have to deal with much current, just the charging current. So somewhere between 500 milliamps to an amp. Uh, so that's the one that's been used to, to turn off the charging current once the voltage on the, any of these cells reaches 4.2 volts. This is the one that's switching the current to the loads. Um, and there is supposed to be a protection diode across here. There is on this other one. It's basically connected across the power tool terminals. And what that means without this diode... It means that if you're pulling the trigger and the battery runs low and it suddenly cuts out when this MOSFET turns off, theoretically, you could get a back EMF spike from the motor in the tool and it could actually damage the MOSFET. It's a bit of a strange thing to leave that out. Uh, other things worthy of note. The other components here are for monitoring when it is charging in the first place and also for detecting overcurrent by measuring uh, the voltage drop across the MOSFET. The MOSFET is a K3918, which is rated 25 volts, 48 amps, and has a very low on state resistance of 7.5 milliohms, which is ridiculous. Anything else worth looking at here? Not really. Let's take a look at the schematic. So here's the schematic. Here's the charging connection here. And the only real difference I can draw in here, should I say, is the other way around. Let's draw it the correct way around. I'll make it an extra big fat diode then. Uh, there's a diode there just to possibly protect uh, against self-discharge through the charging circuitry. It is in fact, because I know exactly what's in these crappy chargers. It's the most basic thing possible. It's basically a little switch mode 12 volt plus supply with a resistor in series and then really rudimentary circuit to measure the voltage across the resistor to tell how much current's flowing through it. Um, this resistor here is used to detect um, when there's an overcurrent situation because when it's charging, uh, it detects via this resistor the that the charge... Uh, is being applied to it and it'll turn on uh, the suitable uh, MOSFET here. But when it's discharging, it turns on this MOSFET and uh, senses the voltage across at that resistor. If it gets too high, it knows that the current flowing through it is huge and it will actually turn the MOSFET off to protect the circuitry. That could also uh, result in that sort of collapsing field thing that the little diode would have been quite handy across that. Hmm. Uh, there's the three cells. With uh, each has its own 1K resistor, 3 times 1K. And if this is following the standard format, I'll guess that those are probably 100 nano. 3 times 100 nano. They're just there to provide basic filtering so it gets a nice stable uh, voltage reference. What else? This resistor, I haven't really a clue what that's for. I don't know if it's a uh, part of the over-discharge protection circuit or not. Not sure. Uh, but it is textbook. It's, it's basically following this schematic on the PCB. Now, here's something worth mentioning. Oh, this is worth mentioning. I'll draw it on this.
because I noticed when I was measuring the voltages across these, oh, hold on, I'm going to measure them again and I'm going to write them down. One moment, please. Okay, I've measured the cells. Incidentally, the construction of these, the cells are all connected in series with uh, this red one actually carrying a lot of the current. Um, but they're connected in series, but at each connection point between a cell, there is that tap-off point so it can monitor the voltage. It's kind of essential in lithium cells. And ideally, because there's no balancing in this circuit, the voltages across each cell should be the same. In this case, cell 1 is 3.69 volts, cell 2 is 3.75, and cell 3 is 3.75. And that slight voltage difference, it's not too bad. But if you have a significant voltage difference between the cells, it severely impacts the charging ability or discharge ability of the pack because this thing is looking for the first one of these to reach 4.2 volts. So supposing uh, this is charged up and this one is lagging behind by, say, about, say, 0 0.06 volts, um, then when one of these cells is going to be the first to reach 4.2 volts and it will cut off the charge while this one isn't quite fully up to charge, and likewise, when you discharge it, the first one that's going, because it didn't get a full charge, the first one that's going to be discharged down to about 3 volts, and this, where this will cut off, is going to be this one. So that one cell out of sync with the others can actually have a significant effect in the cell capacity. And I've seen a situation where people have let batteries, they've stored them in a bucket, water has leaked through the roof, and uh, it's immersed the battery, which isn't a great thing in the first place, but it's just at one edge of the battery, and the pack has survived, but its capacity has gone down because one of the batteries has discharged through the salty, dirty water in the bucket uh, and it just knocks them out of sync. If you opened that battery and it was actually in a clean condition inside, not too corroded, um, keep in mind that faulty circuitry will uh, potentially result in overcharge of a lithium cell and a little incident. But if uh, one of them has gone seriously out of uh, balance with the others, by charging that one back up, or discharge the other ones down to that same level to match all the voltages will often sort of restore the capacity of the pack. But it's also uh, one cell repeatedly dropping voltage as a sign of either faulty circuitry or a damaged cell. And that is a kind of case of the thing to do then is discharge that pack completely and then dispose of it in a recycling system. But there we go. Quite interesting. Nice construction. I mean, it seems nice construction. Certainly, I'm guessing a lot of these are used in Chinese garages. And certainly a lot of DIYers seem to be very happy with them because they're not really hammering them in the same way that a mechanic would. But there we go. Interesting. Now I shall put it back together. And I shall have a, well, cordless ratchet for when I actually end up needing one. But quite neat. Much simpler than I was expecting. Just really simple just that single stage gearbox and the uh the vibrating ratchet mechanism and the battery is also just cut down to the bare minimum but still absolutely functional oh these are uh labeled inr 18650 1500 milliamp hour in a way these little batteries uh, which are very similar to the ones sold by aldi and lidl for their 12 volt tools in a way these are actually quite useful in their own right as 12 volt lithium batteries so all good stuff, all very interesting.